most valuable commodity I know of is information. Wouldn't you agree? This audio is brought to you by Leaders Basement. It can be found in the public domain. Feel free to use and download. Your right to be rich. It is your right to be rich. You are here to lead the abundant life and to be happy, radiant, and free. You should, therefore, have all the money you need to lead a full, happy, prosperous life. There is no virtue in poverty. The latter is a mental disease, and it should be abolished from the face of the earth. You are here to grow, expand, and unfold spiritually, mentally, and materially. You have the inalienable right to fully develop and express yourself along all lines. You should surround yourself with beauty and luxury. Why be satisfied with just enough to go around when you can enjoy the riches of the infinite? In this book, you will learn to make friends with money, and you will always have a surplus. Your desire to be rich is a desire for a fuller, happier, more wonderful life. It is a cosmic urge. It is good and very good. Begin to see money in its true significance as a symbol of exchange. It means to you freedom from want. It means beauty, luxury, abundance, and refinement. As you read this chapter, you are probably saying, I want more money. I am worthy of a higher salary than I am receiving. I believe most people are inadequately compensated. One of the reasons many people do not have more money is that they are silently or openly condemning it. They refer to money as filthy lucre, or they believe that love of money is the root of all evil. Another reason they do not prosper is they have a sneaky subconscious feeling. There is some virtue in poverty. This subconscious pattern may be due to early childhood training, superstition, or it could be based on a false interpretation of the scriptures. There is no virtue in poverty. It is a disease like any other mental disease. If you were physically ill, you would think there was something wrong with you. You would seek help or do something about the condition at once. Likewise, if you do not have money constantly circulating in your life, there is something radically wrong with you. Money is only a symbol. It has taken many forms of the medium of exchange down through the centuries, such as salt, beads, trinkets of various kinds. In early times, man's wealth was determined by the number of sheep or oxen he had. It is much more convenient to write a check than to carry some sheep around with you to pay your bills. God does not want you to live in a hovel or to go hungry. God wants you to be happy, prosperous, and successful. God is always successful in his undertakings, whether he makes a star or a cosmos. You may wish to take a trip around the world, study art in a foreign country, go to college, or send your children to a superior school. You certainly wish to bring up your children in lovely surroundings, so that they might learn to appreciate beauty, order, symmetry, and proportion. You were born to succeed, to win, to conquer all difficulties, and have all your faculties fully developed. If there is financial lack in your life, do something about it. Get away immediately from all superstitious beliefs about money. Do not ever regard money as evil or filthy. If you do, you cause it to take wings and fly away from you. Remember that you lose what you condemn. Suppose, for example, you found gold, silver, lead, copper, or iron in the ground. Would you pronounce these things evil? God pronounced all things good. The evil comes from man's darkened understanding, from his unillumined mind, from his false interpretation of life, and his misuse of divine power. Uranium, lead, or some other metal could have been used in the medium of exchange. We use paper bills, checks, etc. Surely the piece of paper is not evil, neither is a check. Physicists and scientists know today that the only difference between one metal and another is the number and rate of motion of the electrons revolving around a central nucleus. They are now changing one metal into another through a bombardment of the atoms in a powerful cyclotron. Gold under certain conditions becomes mercury. It will only be a little while until gold, silver, and other metals will be made synthetically in a chemical laboratory. I cannot imagine seeing anything evil in electrons, neutrons, protons, and isotopes. The piece of paper in your pocket is composed of electrons and protons arranged differently. Their number and rate of motion is different. That is the only way the paper differs from the silver in your pocket. Some people will say, oh, people kill for money. They steal for money. It has been associated with countless crimes, but that does not make it evil. A man may give another $50 to kill someone. He has misused money in using it for a destructive purpose. You can use electricity to kill someone or to light the house. You can use water to quench the baby's thirst or to use it to drown the child. You can use fire to warm the child or burn it to death. Another illustration would be if you brought some earth from your garden and put it in your coffee cup for breakfast. That would be your evil. Yet the earth is not evil. Neither is the coffee. The earth is misplaced. It belongs in your garden. Similarly, if a needle were stuck in your thumb, it would be your evil. The needle or pin belongs in a pincushion, not in your thumb. 
We know the forces of the elements of nature are not evil. It depends on our use of them, whether they bless or hurt us. A man said to me one time, I am broke. I do not like money. It is the root of all evil. Love of money to the exclusion of everything else will cause you to become lopsided and unbalanced. You are here to use your power or authority wisely. Some men crave power. Others crave money. If you set your heart on money and say, That is all I want. I am going to give all my attention to amassing money. Nothing else matters. You can get money and attain a fortune, but you have forgotten that you are here to lead a balanced life. Man does not live by bread alone. For example, if you belong to some cult or religious group and become fanatical about it, excluding yourself from your friend's society and social activities, you will become unbalanced, inhibited, and frustrated. Nature insists on a balance. If all your time is devoted to external things and possessions, you will find yourself hungry for peace of mind, harmony, love, joy, or perfect health. You will find that you cannot buy anything that is real. You can amass a fortune or have millions of dollars. This is not evil or bad. Love of money to the exclusion of everything else results in frustration, disappointment, and disillusionment. In that sense, it is the root of your evil. By making money your sole aim, you simply made a wrong choice. You thought that it was all you wanted, but you found after all your efforts that it was not only the money you needed. What you really desired was true place, peace of mind, and abundance. You could have the millions of many millions if you wanted them, and still have peace of mind, harmony, perfect health, and divine expression. Everyone wants enough money, and not just enough money to go around. He wants abundance and despair. He should have it. The urges, desires, and impulses we have for food, clothing, homes, better means of transportation, expression, procreation, and abundance are all God-given, divine and good. But we may misdirect these impulses, desires, and urges, resulting in evil or negative experiences in our lives. Man does not have an evil nature. There is no evil nature in you. It is God, the universal wisdom, or life-seeking expression through you. For example, a boy wants to go to college, but he does not have enough money. He sees other boys in the neighborhood going off to college and university. His desire increases. He says to himself, I want an education too. Such a youth may steal or embezzle money for the purpose of going to college. The desire to go to college was basically and fundamentally good. He misdirected that desire or urge by violating the laws of society, the cosmic law of harmony, or the golden rule. Then he finds himself in trouble. However, if this boy knew the laws of mind and his unqualified capacity through the use of the spiritual power to go to college, he would be free and not in jail. Who put him in jail? He placed himself there. The policeman who locked him up in prison was an instrument of the man-made laws which he violated. He first imprisoned himself in his mind by stealing and hurting him himself. Fear and a guilt consciousness followed. There is the prison of the mind, followed by the prison walls made of bricks and stones. Money is a symbol of God's opulence, beauty, refinement, and abundance, and it should be used wisely, judiciously, and constructively to bless humanity in countless ways. It is merely a symbol of the economic health of the nation. When your blood is circulating freely, you are healthy. When money is circulating freely in your life, you are economically healthy. When people begin to hoard money, to put it away in tin boxes, and become charged with fear, there is economic illness. The crash of 1929 was a psychological panic. It was fear seizing the minds of people everywhere. It was a sort of negative, hypnotic spell. You are living in a subjective and objective world. You must not neglect the spiritual food, such as peace of mind, love, beauty, harmony, joy, and laughter. Knowledge of the spiritual power is the means to a royal road to riches of all kinds, whether your desire is spiritual, mental, or material. The student of the laws of mind or the student of the spiritual principle believes and knows absolutely that regardless of the economic situation, stock market fluctuations, depression, strikes, war, or other conditions and circumstance, he will always be amply supplied regardless of what form money may take. The reason for this is he abides in the consciousness of wealth. The student has convinced himself in his mind that wealth is forever flowing freely in his life, and there is always a divine surplus. Should there be a war tomorrow and all the students present holding become valueless, as a German Marx did after the First World War, he would still attract wealth and be cared for, regardless of the form of the new currency took. Wealth is a state of consciousness. It is a mind conditioned to divine supply forever flowing. The scientific thinker looks at money or wealth like the tide. That is, it goes out, but it always comes back. The tide never fails. Neither will man supply when he trusts a tireless, changeless, immortal presence, which is omnipresent and flowing ceaselessly. The man who knows the workings of the subconscious mind is never, therefore, worried about the economic situation, stock market panics, devaluation, or inflation or currency, since he abides in the consciousness of God's eternal supply. 
Such a man is always supplied and watched over by an overshadowing presence. Behold the birds of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in barns, get your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? As you consciously commune with the divine presence, claiming and knowing that it leads and guides you in all your ways, that it is a lamp unto your feet and a light on your path, you will be divinely prospered and sustained beyond your wildest dreams. Here is a simple way for you to impress your subconscious mind with the idea of constant supply or wealth. Quiet the wheels of your mind, relax, let go, immobilize the attention, get into a sleepy, drowsy, meditative state of mind. This reduces effort to the minimum. Then in a quiet, relaxed, passive way, reflect on the following simple truth. Ask yourself, where do ideas come from? Where does wealth come from? Where did you come from? Where did your brain and mind come from? You will be led back to the one source. You find yourself on a spiritual working basis now. It will no longer insult your intelligence to realize that wealth is a state of mind. Take this little phrase, repeat it slowly four or five minutes, three or four times a day quietly to yourself, particularly before you go to sleep. Money is forever circulating freely in my life, and there is always a divine surplus. As you do this regularly and systematically, the idea of wealth will be conveyed to your deeper mind, and you will develop a wealth consciousness. Idle mechanical repetition will not succeed in building the consciousness of wealth. Begin to feel the truth of what you affirm. You know what you are doing and why you are doing it. You know your deeper self is responsive to what you consciously accept as true. In the beginning, people who are in financial difficulties do not get results with such affirmations as, I am wealthy, I am prosperous, I am successful. Such statements may cause their conditions to get worse. The reason is the subconscious mind will only accept the dominant of two ideas or the dominant mood or feeling. When they say, I am prosperous, their feeling of lack is greater, and something within them says, no, you're not prosperous, you're broke. The feeling of lack is dominant so that each affirmation calls forth the mood of lack and more lack becomes theirs. The way to overcome this for beginners is to affirm what the conscious and subconscious mind will agree upon. Then there will be no contradiction. Our subconscious mind accepts our beliefs, feelings, convictions, and what we consciously accept is true. A man could engage the cooperation of his subconscious mind by saying, I am prospering every day. I am growing in wealth and in wisdom every day. Every day my wealth is multiplying. I am advancing, growing, and moving forward financially. These and similar statements would not create any conflict in the mind. For instance, if a salesman has only ten cents in his pocket, he could easily agree that he could have more tomorrow if he sold a pair of shoes tomorrow. There is nothing within him which says his sales could not increase. He could use statements such as, My sales are increasing every day. I am advancing and moving forward. He would find these would be sound psychologically and acceptable to his mind, and they would produce desirable fruit. The spiritually advanced student who quickly, knowingly, and feeling says, I am prosperous, I am successful, I am wealthy, gets wonderful results also. Why would this be true when they think, feel, or say, I am prosperous? They mean God is all supply or infinite riches, and what is true of God is true of them. When they say, I am wealthy, they know God is infinite supply, the inexhaustible treasure house, and what is true of God is therefore true of them, for God is within them. Many men get wonderful results by dwelling on three abstract ideas such as health, wealth, and success. Health is a divine reality or quality of God. Wealth is of God. It is eternal and endless. Success is of God. God is always successful in all his undertaking. The way they produce remarkable results is to stand before a mirror as they shave and repeat for five or ten minutes, health, wealth, and success. They do not say, I am healthy or I am successful. They create no opposition in their minds. They are quiet and relaxed, thus the mind is receptive and passive. Then they repeat these words. Amazing results follow. All they are doing is identifying with truth that are eternal, changeless, and timeless. You can develop a wealth consciousness, put the principles enunciated and elaborated on in this book to practice, and your desert will rejoice and blossom as the rose. I worked with a young boy in Australia many years ago who wanted to become a physician and surgeon, but he had no money, nor had he graduated from high school. For expenses, he used to clean doctors' offices, wash windows, and do odd jobs. He told me that every night as he went to sleep, he used to see a diploma on his wall with his name in big, bold letters. He used to clean and shine the diplomas in the medical building where he worked. It was not hard for him to engrave the diploma in his mind and develop it there. I do not know how long he continued this imagining, but it must have been for some months. Results followed as he persisted. 
One of the doctors took a great liking to this young boy, and after training him in the art of sterilizing instruments, giving hypodermic injections, and other miscellaneous first aid work, he became a technical assistant in his office. The doctor sent him to high school and also to college at his own expense. Today this man is a prominent doctor in Montreal, Canada. He had a dream, a clear image in his mind. His wealth was in his mind. Wealth is your idea, desire, talent, urge for service, capacity to give to mankind, your ability for usefulness to society, and your love for humanity in general. This young boy operated a great law unconsciously. Thomas Troward said, Having seen the end, you have willed the means to the realization of the end. The end in this boy's case was to be a physician. To imagine, see and feel the reality of being a doctor now, to live with that idea, sustain it, nourish it, and to love it until through this imagination is penetrated the layers of the subconscious mind, become a conviction, and pave the way to the fulfillment of your dreams. He could have said, I have no education. I do not know the right people. I am too old to go to school now. I have no money. It would take years, and I am not intelligent. He would then be beaten before he started. His wealth was in the use of his spiritual power within him, which responded to his thought. The means or the way in which our power is answered is always hidden from us, except that occasionally we may intuitively perceive a part of the process. My ways are past finding out. The ways are not known. The only thing man has to do is to imagine and accept the end in his mind and leave its unfoldment to the subjective wisdom within. Oftentimes the question is asked, what should I do after meditating on the end and accepting my desire in consciousness? The answer is simple. You will be compelled to do whatever is necessary for the unfoldment of your ideal. The law of the subconscious is compulsion. The law of life is action and reaction. What we do is the automatic response to our inner movements of the mind, inner feeling and conviction. A few months ago, as I went to sleep, I imagined I was reading one of my most popular books, Magic of Faith in French. I began to realize and imagine this book going to an all-French-speaking nation. For several weeks I did this every night, falling asleep with the imaginary French edition of Magic of Faith in my hands. Just before Christmas in 1954, I received a letter from a leading publisher in Paris, France, enclosing a contract drawn up asking me to sign it, giving him permission to publish and promote abroad to all French-speaking countries the French edition of Magic of Faith. You might ask me, what did I do about the publishing of this book after prayer? I would have to say nothing. The subjective wisdom took over and brought it to pass in its own way, which was a far better way than any method I could consciously devise. All of our external movements, motions and actions follow the inner movements of the mind. Inner action precedes all outer action. Whatever steps you take physically or what you seem to do objectively will all be a part of a pattern which you are compelled to fulfill. Accepting the end wills the means to the realization of the end. Believe that you have it now and you shall receive it. We must cease denying our good, realize that the only thing that keeps us from the riches that lie all around us is our mental attitude, or the way we look at God, life, and the world in general. No believe and act on the positive assumption that there is no reason why you cannot have, be, and do whatever you wish to accomplish through the great laws of God. Your knowledge of how your mind works is your Savior and Redeemer. Thought and feeling are your destiny. You possess everything by right of consciousness. The consciousness of health produces health. The consciousness of wealth produces wealth. The world seems to deny or oppose what you pray for. Your senses sometimes mock and laugh at you. If you say to your friend that you are opening up a new business for yourself, he may proceed to give you all the reasons why you are bound to fail. If you are susceptible to his hypnotic spell, he may instill fear of failure in your mind. As you become aware of the spiritual power which is one and indivisible, and which responds to your thought, you will reject the darkness and ignorance of the world and know that you possess all the equipment, power, and knowledge to succeed. To walk on the royal road to riches, you must not place obstacles and impediments on the pathway of others. Neither must you be jealous or envious of them. Actually, when you entertain these negative states of mind, you are hurting and injuring yourself because you are thinking and feeling it. The suggestion, as Quimby said, you give to another, you are giving to yourself. This is the reason that the law of the golden rule is a cosmic divine rule. I am sure you have heard men say, that fellow has a racket, he is a racketeer, he is getting money dishonestly, he is a faker, I knew him when he had nothing, he is crooked, a thief and a swindler. If you analyze a man who talks like that, he is usually in want or suffering from some financial or physical illness. Perhaps his former college friends went up the ladder of success and excelled him. Now he is bitter and envious of their progress. In many instances, this is the cause of his downfall. 
thinking negatively on these classmates and condemning their wealth causes the wealth and prosperity he is praying for to vanish and flee away. He is condemning the thing he is praying for. He is praying two ways. On the one hand, he is saying, God is prospering me. And in the next breath, silently or audibly, he is saying, I resent that fellow's wealth. Always make it a special point to bless the other person and rejoice in his prosperity and success. When you do, you bless and prosper yourself. If you go into the bank and see your competitor across the street deposit 20 times more than you do, or you see him deposit $10,000, rejoice and be exceedingly glad to see God's abundance being manifest through one of his sons. You are then blessing and exalting what you are praying for. What you bless, you multiply. What you condemn, you lose. If you are working in a large organization and you are silently thinking of and resenting the tact that you are underpaid and that you are not appreciated and that you deserve more money and greater recognition, you are subconsciously severing your ties with that organization. You are setting a law in motion. Then the superintendent or manager says to you, we have to let you go. You dismissed yourself. The manager was simply the instrument through which your own mental negative attitude was confirmed. In other words, he was a messenger telling you what you conceived is true about yourself. It was an example of law of action and reaction. The action was the internal movement of your mind. The reaction was the response of the outer world to conform to your inner thinking. Perhaps as you read this, you are thinking of someone who has prospered financially by taking advantage of others, by defrauding them, by selling them unsound investments in property, etc. The answer to this is obvious, because if we rob, cheat, or defraud another, we do the same to ourselves. In reality, in this case, we are actually hurting or robbing from ourselves. We are in a mood of lack in the first place, which is bound to attract loss to us. The loss may come in many ways. It may come in the loss of health, prestige, peace of mind, social status, sickness in the home or in business. It may not necessarily come in loss of money. We must not be short-sighted and think that the loss has to come in just dollars and cents. Isn't it a wonderful feeling to place your head on a pillow at night and feel you are at peace with the whole world, and that your heart is full of goodwill toward all? There are some people who have accumulated money the wrong way by trampling on others, trickery, deceit, and chicanery. What is the price? Sometimes it is mental and physical disease, guilt complexes, insomnia, or hidden fears. As one man said to me, Yes, I rode roughshod over others. I got what I wanted, but I got cancer doing it. He realized he had attained his wealth in the wrong way. You can be wealthy and prosperous without hurting anyone. Many men are constantly robbing themselves. They steal from themselves peace of mind, health, joy, inspiration, happiness, and the laughter of God. They may say that they have never stolen, but is it true? Every time we resent another or are jealous or envious of another's wealth or success, we are stealing from ourselves. These are the thieves and robbers which Jesus cast out of the temple. Likewise, you must cast them out incisively and decisively. Do not let them live in your mind. Cut their heads off with the fire of right thought and feeling. I remember in the early days of the war reading about a woman in Brooklyn, New York, who went around from store to store buying up all the coffee she could. She knew it was going to be rationed. She was full of fear that there would not be enough for her. She bought as much as she could and stored in her cellar. That evening she went to church services. When she came home, burglars had broken down the door, stolen not only the coffee, but silverware, money, jewelry, and other things. This good woman said what they all say. Why did this happen to me when I was at church? I never stole from anyone. Is it true? Was she not in the consciousness of lack and fear when she began to hoard supplies of coffee? Her mood and fear of lack were sufficient to bring about loss in her home and possession. She did not have to put her hand in the cash register or rob a bank. Her fear of lack produced lack. This is the reason that many people, who are what society calls good citizens, suffer loss. They are good in the worldly sense, that is, they pay their taxes, they obey the laws, vote regularly, and are generous to charities. But they are resentful of others' possessions, their wealth or social position. If they would like to take money when no one was looking, such an attitude is definitely and positively a state of lack, and may cause the person who indulges in such a mental state to attract charlatans or knaves who may swindle or cheat them in some business transaction. Before the outer thief robs us, we have first robbed ourselves. There must be an inner thief before the outer one appears. A man can have a guilt complex and accuse himself constantly. I knew such a man. He was very honest as a teller in the bank. He never stole any money, but he had an illicit romance. He was supporting another woman and denying his family. He lived in fear that he would be discovered. A deep sense of guilt resulted. Fear follows guilt. Fear causes the contraction of the muscles and mucous membranes. Acute sinusitis developed. Medication gave him only temporary relief. I explained to this client the cause of his trouble and told him the cure was to give up his outside affair. 
He said he couldn't, she was a soulmate, and that he had tried. He was always condemning and accusing himself. One day he was accused by one of the officials of the bank of having embezzled some money. It looked serious for him, as the evidence was circumstantial. He became panic-stricken and realized the only reason he was wrongfully accused was that he had been accusing and condemning himself. He saw how mind operates. Inasmuch as he was always accusing himself on the inner plane, he would be accused on the outer. He immediately broke off the relationship with the other woman due to shock of being accused of embezzling and began to pray for divine harmony and understanding between himself and the bank official. He began to claim, there is nothing hidden that is not revealed. The peace of God reigns supreme in the minds and hearts of all concerned. Truth prevailed. The whole matter was dissolved in the light of truth. Another young man was discovered as the culprit. The bank teller knew that only through prayer was he saved from a jail sentence. The great law is, as you would that men should think about you, think you about them in the same manner. As you would that men should feel about you, feel you also about them in like manner. Say from your heart, I wish for every man who walks the earth what I wish for myself. The sincere wish of my heart is, therefore, peace, joy, love, and abundance, and God's blessing to all men everywhere. Rejoice and be glad in the progression, advancement, and prosperity of all men. Whatever you claim is true for yourself, claim it for all men everywhere. If you pray for happiness and peace of mind, let your claim be peace and happiness for all. Do not ever try to deprive another of any joy. If you do, you deprive yourself. When the ship comes in for your friend, it comes in for you also. If someone is promoted in your organization, be glad and happy. Congratulate him. Rejoice in his advancement and recognition. If you are angry or resentful, you are demoting yourself. Do not try to withhold from another his God-given birthright to happiness, success, achievement, abundance, and all good things. Jesus said, Store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where the moth and rust doth not consume, and where thieves cannot break through and steal. Hatred and resentment rot and corrode the heart, causing us to become full of scars, impurities, toxins, and poisons. The treasures of heavens are the truth of God which we possess in our soul. Fill your minds with peace, harmony, faith, joy, honesty, integrity, loving kindness, and gentleness. Then you will be sowing for yourself treasures in the heavens of your own mind. If you are seeking wisdom regarding investments, or if you are worried about your stocks or bonds, quietly claim infinite intelligence governs and watches all over my financial transactions, and whatever I do, I shall prosper. Do this frequently, and you will find that your investments will be wise. Moreover, you will be protected from loss, as you will be promoted to sell these securities or holdings before any loss accrues to you. Let the following prayer be used daily by you regarding your home, business, and possession. The overshadowing presence, which guides the planets on their courses, and causes the sun to shine, watches over all my possessions, home, business, and all things that are mine. God is my fortress and vault. All my possessions are secure in God. It is wonderful. By reminding yourself daily of this great truth, and by observing the laws of love, you will always be guided, watched over, and prospered in all your ways. You will never suffer from loss, for you have chosen the Most High as your counselor and guide. The envelope of God's love surrounds, enfolds, and encompasses you at all time. You rest in the everlasting arms of God. All of us should seek an inner guidance for our problems. If you have a financial problem, repeat this before you retire at night. Now I shall sleep in peace. I have turned this matter over to God, wisdom within. It knows only the answer. As the sun rises in the morning, so will my answer be resurrected. I know the sunrise never fails. Then go off to sleep. Do not fret, fuss, and fume over a problem. Night brings counsel. Sleep on it. Your intellect cannot solve all your problems. Pray for the light it is to come. Remember that the dawn always comes. Then the shadows flee away. Let your sleep every night be a contented bliss. You are not a victim of circumstances, except you believe you are. You can rise and overcome any circumstances or condition. You will have different experiences as you stand on the rock of spiritual truth, steadfast and faithful to your deeper purpose and desire. In large stores, the management employs store detectives to prevent people from stealing. They catch a number every day trying to get something for nothing. All such people are living in a consciousness of lack and limitation, and they are stealing from themselves, attracting at the same time all manner of loss. These people lack faith in God and the understanding of how their minds work. If they would pray for true place, divine expression and supply, they would find work. Then by honesty, integrity, and perseverance, they would become a credit to themselves and society at large. Jesus said, For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. 
the poor states of consciousness are always with us in a sense that no matter how much wealth you have now, there is something you want with all your heart. It may be a problem of health. Perhaps a son or daughter needs guidance or harmony is lacking in the home. At that moment, you are poor. We could not know what abundance was except we were conscious of lack. I have chosen twelve, and one of you is a devil. Whether it be the king of England or a boy in the slums, we are all born into limitation and into the race belief. It is through these limitations we grow. We could never discover the inner power except through problems and difficulties. These are our poor states, which prod us into seeking a solution. We could not know what joy was, except we could shed a tear of sorrow. We must be aware of poverty to seek liberation and freedom and ascend into God's opulence. The poor states, such as fear, ignorance, worry, lack, and pain, are not bad when they cause you to seek the opposite. When you get into trouble and get kicked from pillar to post, when you ask negative, heart-rendering questions such as, Why are all these things happening to me? Why does there seem to be a jinx following me? Light will come to your mind, through your suffering, pain, or misery. You will discover the truth which sets you free. Sweet are the uses of adversity, like a toad ugly and venomous, yet wears a precious jewel on its head. Through dissatisfaction we are led to satisfaction. All those studying the laws of life have been dissatisfied with something. They have had some problem or difficulty, which they could not solve, or they were not satisfied with the man-made answers to life's riddles. They have found their answer in a God presence within themselves, and a pearl of great price, the precious jewel. The Bible says, I sought the Lord, and I found him, and he delivered me from all my fears. When you realize your ambition or desire, you will be satisfied for only a brief period of time. Then the urge to expand will come again. This is life seeking to express itself at higher levels through you. When one desire is satisfied, another comes to infinity. You are here to grow. Life is progression. It is not static. You are here to go from glory to glory. There is no end, for there is no end to God's glory. We are all poor in the sense we are forever seeking more light, wisdom, happiness, and greater joy out of life. God is infinite, and never in eternity could you exhaust the glory, beauty, and wisdom which is within. This is how wonderful you are. In the absolute state, all things are finished, but in the relative world we must awaken to the glory which was ours before the world was. No matter how wise you are, you are seeking more wisdom, so you are still poor. No matter how intelligent you are in the field of mathematics, physics, or astronomy, you are only scratching the surface. You are still poor. The journey is ever onward, upward, and Godward. It is really an awakening process, whereby you realize creation is finished. When you know God does not have to learn, grow, expand, or unfold, you begin to gradually awaken from the dream of limitation and become alive in God. As the scales of fear, ignorance, race belief, and mass hypnosis fall from your eyes, you begin to see as God sees. The blind spots are removed. Then you begin to see the world as God made it, for we begin to see it through God's eyes. Now you say, Behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Feed the poor within you. Clothe the naked ideas and give them form by believing in the reality of the idea, trusting the great fabricator within to clothe it in form and objectify it. Now your word or idea shall become flesh or take form. When you are hungry or in poor states, you seek food. When you are worried, you seek peace. When you are sick, you seek health. When you are weak, you seek strength. Your desire for prosperity is the voice of God in you, telling you that abundance is yours. Therefore, your poor state, you find the urge to grow, to expand, to unfold, to achieve, and to accomplish your desires. A pain in your shoulder is a blessing in disguise. It tells you to do something about it at once. If there were no pain and no indication of trouble, your arm might fall off on the street. Your pain is God's alarm system telling you to seek His peace and His healing power and move from darkness to light. When cold, you build a fire. When you are hungry, you eat. When you are in lack, enter into the mood of opulence and plenty. Imagine the end. Rejoice in it. Having imagined the end and felt it is true, you have willed the means to the realization of the end. When you are fearful and worried, feed your mind with the great truth of God that has stood the test of time and will last forever. You can receive comfort by meditating on the great psalm. For example, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God is my refuge, my salvation, whom shall I fear? God is an ever-present help in time of trouble. My God in Him will I trust. He shall cover me with His feathers, and under His wings shall I rest. One with God is a majority. If God be for me, who can be against me? I do all things through Christ which strengthen me. Let the healing vibrations of these truths flood your mind and heart. Then you will crowd out your mind all your fears, doubts, and worries through this meditative process. 
imbibe another great spiritual truth. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. A merry heart hath a continual feast. A merry heart doth good like a medicine. A broken spirit drieth the bones. Therefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God within thee. Begin now to stir up the gift of God by completely rejecting the evidence of senses, the tyranny and disposition of the race mind, and give complete recognition to the spiritual power within you as the only cause, the only power, and the only presence. Know that it is a responsive and beneficent power. Draw nigh unto it, and it will draw nigh unto you. Turn to it devotedly with assurance, trust, and love. It will respond to you as love, peace, guidance, and prosperity. It will be your comforter, guide, counselor, and your heavenly Father. You will then say, God is love, I have found him, and he truly has delivered me from all my fears. Furthermore, you will find yourself in green pastures, where abundance and all of God's riches flow freely through you. Say to yourself freely and joyously during the day, I walk in the consciousness of the presence of God all day long. His fullness flows through me at all times, filling up all the empty vessels in my life. When you are filled full of the feeling of being what you long to be, your prayers answered. Are all the vessels full in your life? Look under health, wealth, love, and expression. Are you fully satisfied on all levels? Is there something lacking in one of these four? All that you seek, no matter what it is, comes under one of these classifications. If you say, all I want is truth or wisdom, you are expressing the desire of all men everywhere. That is what everyone wants, even though he or she may word it differently. Truth or wisdom is the overall desire of every man. This comes under the classification of expression. You wish to express more and more of God here and now. Through your lack, limitation, and problems, you grow in God's light and you discover yourself. There is no other way whereby you could discover yourself. If you could not use your power two ways, you would never discover yourself. Neither would you ever deduce a law governing you. If you were compelled to be good or compelled to love, that would not be love. You would then be an automaton. You have freedom to love because you can give it or retain it. If compelled to love, there is no love. Aren't you flattered when some woman tells you that she loves you and wants you? She has chosen you from all the men in the world. She does not have to love you. If she were forced to love you, you would not be flattered or happy about it. You have freedom to be a murderer or a holy man. That is the reason that we praise such men as Lincoln and others. They decided to choose the good. We praise them for their choice. If we believe that circumstances, conditions, events, age, race, religious training, or early environment can preclude the possibility of our attaining a happy, prosperous life, we are thieves and robbers. All that is necessary to express happiness and prosperity is to feel happy and prosperous. The feeling of wealth produces wealth. States of consciousness manifest themselves. This is why it is said, All that ever came before me, feeling, are thieves and robbers. Feeling is the law, and the law is feeling. Your desire for prosperity is really the promise of God saying that his riches are yours. Accept this promise without any mental reservation. Quimby likened prayer to a lawyer pleading the case before the judge. This teacher of the laws of mind said he could prove the defendant was not guilty as charged, but that the person was a victim of lies and false belief. You are the judge. You render your own verdict. Then you are set free. The negative thoughts of lack, poverty, and failure are all false. They are all lies. There is nothing to back them up. You know there is only one spiritual power, one primal cause, and you, therefore, cease giving power to conditions, circumstances, and opinions of men. Give all power to the spiritual power within you, knowing that it will respond to your thought of abundance and prosperity. Recognizing the supremacy of the spirit within and the power of your own thought or mental image is the way to opulence, freedom, and constant supply. Accept the abundant life in your own mind. Your mental acceptance and expectancy of wealth has its own mathematics and mechanics of expression. As you enter into the mood of opulence, all things necessary for the abundant life will come to pass. You are now the judge arriving at a decision in the courthouse of your mind. You have, like Quimby, produced indisputable evidence showing how the laws of your mind work, and you are now free from fear. You have executed and chopped the heads off of all the fears and superstitious thoughts in your mind. Fear is a signal for action. It is not really bad. It tells you to move to the opposite, which is faith in God and all positive values. Let this be your daily prayer. Write it in your heart. God is the source of my supply. That supplies my supply now. His riches flow to... Wouldn't you agree?